Tempo preschool video offers the perfect entertainment for the under fives. There's tales with unexpected twists and lots of fun in Not Now Bernard and Other Stories by David McKee. And I Want a Cat and Other Stories by Tony Ross includes the best-selling toddler classic I Want My Potty and Super Duper Jezebel. There's lots of fun for all the family. Sing along to all your favorite rhymes with Tempo's very own Golden Treasury of Nursery Rhymes. There's lots of favorite friends in the six stories featured on the Mr. Men and Little Miss video. Meet the Junglies and join Tyrone Tiger on his first day at school. Don't miss the world's most lovable puppy and his friends in Spot's first video and the adventures of Spot. And learning can also be fun with Spot's alphabet and Spot learns to count, introducing basic educational concepts that any child can enjoy. Young Tom Pottage has difficulty coming to terms with his alphabet and counting, but Postman Pat is always ready to lend a hand. A timeless favorite with all children are the Paddington Bear stories, written by Michael Bond and narrated by Sir Michael Horton. Bump the Baby Elephant features in these gentle stories delightfully narrated by Simon Cadell. And perfect for pre-bedtime viewing are the tempo range of classic tales. The tales of Aesop are brought to life with delightful puppet animation and humorously narrated by Tom Baker. And Tell Me a Story includes well-loved stories told by Jan Francis. There's something for everyone with Tempo Video.
Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Such fun and the dish ran away with the spoon.
put the kettle on, we'll all have tea. Suki, take it off again. Suki, take it off again. Suki, take it off again. They've all gone away. La 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 la. Shall I wander upstairs and downstairs and in my lady's chamber? 
Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. Pat a cake, pat a cake, baker's man Bake me a cake as fast as you can Pat it and break it and mark it with me Put it in the oven for baby and me
market, this little pig stayed at home. This little pig had roast beef, and this little pig had none. And this little pig went wee 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 all the way
Mr. Bobbin. I'll never win a prize with this marrow. I'll never win a prize with that marrow, said Harry Dabble. It's too little and tiny and small and puny. I know that, said Mr. Bobbin, but I've tried everything. Oh, said Mr. Dabble. It's obvious to me that you haven't tried my super duper double deluxe giant marrow fertilizer. I don't know if I want that, said Mr. Bobbin. You'll see a big difference in that marrow in a day or two, said Harry. I can see the difference already, said Mr. Bobbin. Oh dear, said Gary. I think this must be the super duper double deluxe weed killer. Oh ninny, said Harry. Look at my poor marrow, said Mr. Bobbin. Quick, Gary, said Mr. Dabble. We might save it yet. Go and get the proper tin. But, but, said Mr. Bobbin. It's a good thing we were here, Mr. Bobbin, said Harry. But it was your weed killer. Here's the, here's the fur, here's the fertiliser, Dad, said Gary, panting. I don't think, said Mr. Bobbin. I don't trust your concoctions, said Mr. Bobbin. In 24 hours, that'll be a new marrow, said Harry. The vegetable shows this afternoon, said Mr. Bobbin grumpily. Never worked as well as that before, said Harry. You're bound to win a prize with that, said Gary. My goodness! You're right, said Mr. Bobbin. But how on earth shall I get it to the show? Leave that to Dabble and Son, said Harry. Are you sure it's not too heavy for your van? asked Mr. Bobbin. I'm, uh, I'm a bit worried about the tyres, said Mr. Dabble. They look all right to me, said Mr. Bobbin. Jump on then, said Mr. Dabble, and we'll be off. It's, uh, it's going very smoothly, considering the weight, said Gary. But uh, shouldn't you turn left here? I'm trying to turn left, said Harry. There must be something wrong with his steering wheel. Whoa, 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 said Harry. Have you all fixed it, Dad? asked Gary. Fixed it, said Harry. Why don't you look out of your window? Mm -hmm. said Gary. Where's the road gone? The van's never flown before, said Harry. Must be something to do with that marrow. Go out and see, Gary. Rightio, Dad, said Gary. Uh -uh, said Gary. Oh! You'll have to get out, said Mr. Dabble. The only way for us to get down is to let some air out of the marrow. Y'all can puncture it with this. Oh, all right, said Gary. I suppose I'll have to. I shall have to make do with entering my tomatoes, said Mr. Bobbin.
Hello, Sponge, said Mr. Bobbin. I'd keep him out of your new house if I were you, said the furniture man. He's a proper mischief maker, that cat is. Oh, he looks a nice puss to me. Look, we've made friends already. Huh, said Mr. Dabble. Help, said Mr. Dabble. Get him away from me. <laughs> he thinks it's a lion, chuckled Mr. Bobbin. I'll leave off, Dad. <laughs> He's only teasing. Come on, let's get Mr. Bobbin's furniture out. All right, then. Ow, said Mr. Dabble. But, Mr. Bobbin, take it from me. When that gets around, anything can happen. Oh, I'm sure he'll behave, said Mr. Bobbin. I'll go and get him a saucer of milk. And I think we could all do with a nice cup of tea. That'll be very agreeable, thought the two devils. said Gary. Where's all the furniture? What? said Mr. Dabble. Oh, dear. Mr. Dabble, said the policeman. We can't have this mess, you know. It's blocking the road up. I take it that Sponge has been up to his tricks again. I see. I shall have to make a note of this in my notebook. He's always making notes in his notebook, said Gary. Come on, let's get on with it, said Harry. <laughs> Tea's ready, said Mr. Bobbin. Oh, dear me, he said. Did I forget to tell you that I wanted the furniture inside?
do you think it can be, Mr. Dabble? It's a blockage, that is. Tea leaves, probably. Get it off, said Harry. Sorry, Dad, said Gary. Oh! Oh! said Gary. I'm afraid it's still blocked up, said Mr. Bobbin. Holly, I'll have to look underneath, said Harry. said Harry. Sonny dead, said Gary. Well, it's still blocked, said Mr. Dabble. We'll have to use the rods. Give me, give me a hand, Dad, said Gary. It's, it's stuck. Oh, all right, said Mr. Dabble. Down you go, said Harry. Oh! Perhaps it'll be a bit quieter down here, said Gary. Hey, I can't find where my feet go. Oops! My feet are all wet, said Gary. Stop complaining, said Mr. Dabble. Look for Mr. Bobbin's pipe. Here it is, said Gary. Dad, said Gary, I think I've found the blockage. Mr. Bobbin, said the policeman, you are causing a obstruction in the public highway, Hege. Well, said Mr. Bobbin, Mr. Dabble told me I'd got a blockage under the sink, so we've cleared all this rubbish and, well, by the sound of it, I've still got a blockage under my sink. It doesn't sound like plumbing to me, said the policeman. Oh dear, oh dear, said Mr. Bobby. Was that the noise all the time? Oh, I'd quite forgotten. It's a pudding for sponge. I see, said the policeman. It's a sponge pudding. <laughs>
Dick Whittington. In this village, a long time ago, lived a boy who had no mother or father. His name was Dick Whittington. He had no other children to play with, and every day, all he could do was listen to the grown-ups talking about the wonderful places they had seen. They used to talk about London, which they said was one of the most beautiful cities they'd been to. They told Dick the streets of London were paved with gold. Dick kept on thinking about how streets would look paved with gold. He really couldn't imagine what they would be like. He could not get these thoughts out of his mind, and he decided that he would go there, no matter how long it took him. So one day, he wrapped up the few things he possessed, tied the bundle to a stick, and set off for the big city. And what a long way it was. The road seemed to go on forever. But every time his feet hurt, he kept thinking about those golden streets. Many days passed, and then he saw in front of him the fabulous city of London. He ran, shouting, I've arrived, I've arrived! Soon I will see the streets of gold! But he didn't find the golden streets. Instead, he found that they were made of stone. In tears, he sat down outside a house. It was Mr. Fitzwarren's house. The door opened and out came the cook, who shouted at Dick to go away. She was very angry and was about to beat him when Mr. Fitzwarren came out of the house. With him was his beautiful daughter, Alice. Take him to the kitchen and give him something to eat, said Mr. Fitzwarren. And if he wants to stay, let him. Dick was given a huge meal, and he decided he would like to stay at the house. Dick would have been very happy if it hadn't been for one thing. The cook didn't like him. She kept him working from early in the morning till late at night. If anything went wrong, she would beat him. Dick had an awful time. He slept in the attic in a little bed. When he tried to sleep, he was kept awake by mice. All night long, the mice would scamper and squeak and jump in his bed. The mice were such a nuisance that he decided to spend all his money, which was exactly one penny, on a cat. One morning, he set out to buy a cat, which would catch the mice. Dick loved his cat very much indeed, and gave him lots of milk to drink. Soon, of course, there were no mice left. One day, Mr. Fitzwarren told Dick he was sailing away to another country. He asked Dick if there was anything he could buy for him. I haven't any money, Dick said. But he told Mr. Fitzwarren he could take his cat, which would keep the ship free from mice. That's the last you'll see of your cat, snarled the cook. Dick was very sad when his cat left, so Mr. Fitzwarren's daughter gave him some money to buy another one. The cook became meaner and meaner. Soon Dick could stand it no longer and decided to run away from London and never go back. Again, he wrapped up all he had and set off through the snow. He really didn't know where to go or what to do. Suddenly, he heard the chiming of bells. He listened and listened. They seemed to be saying, Turn again, Dick Whittington, turn again. One day, you will be Lord Mayor of London. 
I believe you, great bells, cried Dick, and turned back as the bells had told him, back to Mr. Fitzwarren's house and the horrible cook. The cook treated him worse than ever, but Dick didn't care. He kept thinking of what the bells had told him, that one day he would be Lord Mayor of London. Far, far away, Mr. Fitzwarren's ship came to the harbour of a strange land. The crew came ashore, bringing with them all the things they'd brought to sell. They all set off for a strange town, far away from their ship. It was hot. They walked for miles and miles. At last, they arrived. Here we are, said Mr Fitzwarren. Let's go and sell our goods. He marched through the little winding streets at the head of his sailors and soon came to the king's palace. The guards looked very stern. The king didn't want to buy the things Mr Fitzwarren and his men had brought, but he said he would give anything if someone could rid his country of the mice that were everywhere. Mr Fitzwarren ran out of the palace, through the city, across the desert, back to his ship. And then, puffing and panting, ran all the way back to the palace again. He held out a sack to the king, saying, Great king, in this sack, is the end to your problem. And out jumped Dick Whittington's cat. In a few days, there were no mice left. The king told Mr Fitzwarren that if he would leave the cat, he could have half the king's treasure. Mr Fitzwarren agreed. And so he sailed for home. One day he arrived back in London. He stood in front of his big house with his daughter by his side. He asked all his servants to come to him and then he told Dick that half of the king's treasure was his because if it hadn't been for the cat he had given him nothing like this would have happened. So Dick became rich. He bought new clothes. He bought presents for all the servants. Yes, even for the cook, who was so amazed at Dick's kindness that she smiled, whistled and sang. From that day on, she was a different person. Alice, Mr Fitzwarren's daughter, who liked Dick very much, agreed to marry him. Years passed by and the message of the great bells came true. Dick, one day, became the Lord Mayor of London. When he was famous, he often thought of his cat and wondered where it was. Dick's cat was living in great comfort in a beautiful palace at the other side of the world. Perhaps he knew that without him, this story could never have been told. <laughs> Thank you.
the Emperor. In a peaceful country far, far away, there lived an emperor who liked nothing better than new clothes. Everybody was very annoyed about this because he was spending all the money the townspeople paid in taxes and he did not pay those to whom he owed money. He hardly paid any of his bills at all. He didn't bother to pay the soldiers in his army. He didn't bother about anything except new clothes for himself. While the soldiers marched up and down and the townspeople became more and more angry, the emperor would stay in his room and change his clothes six or seven times a day. In fact, everybody was very unhappy indeed, except the emperor. One day, two weavers arrived in town. Weavers are people who make cloth, but these two weren't real weavers. They just wanted to make some money without doing any work. So they told everyone that the cloth they made was the finest in the world, but that only those who were very clever could see it. Those who hadn't any brains couldn't see the cloth at all. It wasn't very long before the emperor heard about the weavers and asked to see them. He told the weavers they must make him some new clothes. The weavers said this would cost a lot of money as their cloth had to be made from the finest silk and the purest gold thread. Oh, that's all right, the emperor told them. You will be paid well for your work. The emperor called for his Lord Chamberlain and told him to find room for his weavers to work and to give them as much silk and gold thread as they wanted. The Lord Chamberlain did not trust the two weavers, but he had to do as the emperor told him. Eventually, he brought the weavers everything they asked for. They told the Chamberlain to go away so they could get on with their work. When the Lord Chamberlain left, the weavers laughed themselves silly. <laughs> They bundled the beautiful, priceless pieces of thread into their bags and pretended to work all night making the clothes. One day, the emperor wondered whether his new suit was ready or not, but he was worried in case he wasn't clever enough to see the cloth so he sent the Lord Chamberlain instead. The weavers were ready for him, and one of them pretended to hold up a piece of cloth for him to see. Of course, there was nothing there at all. Marvellous, said the Lord Chamberlain. He dared not admit he couldn't see anything, otherwise they would think he was foolish. Absolutely marvellous. We want some more silver and gold thread, said the weavers. The emperor asked how things were coming along and was told the cloth was magnificent. Then give them more thread, commanded the emperor. Next day, 
he sent someone to see when the suit would be finished. The weavers again held up nothing, and the messenger from the emperor had to say how wonderful the cloth was, as he didn't want them to think he had no brains either. He went back to the emperor and told him the clothes would be ready in about a week. Then, said the emperor, next week I shall leave my court through the tower wearing the most beautiful suit in the world. He thought that if two members of his court had seen the cloth, and they didn't have as many brains as he had, then he would surely be able to see it. And so he stopped worrying about it. The big day arrived. The suit was ready to be collected from the weavers. The emperor went to the weavers himself and they pretended to show him the suit, which of course was not there at all. He couldn't say he was unable to see anything, cause the whole town would have thought he had no brains. So he told them how marvelous the suit looked. Not long after this, the weavers arrived at the palace with a pile of boxes. Opening them, they again showed the emperor his wonderful suit, which was not there at all. They showed him his trousers, which were not there at all. They showed him a scarf, which was not there at all. His coat, which was not there at all. And they told him that the suit was so light, he would hardly feel he was wearing it. They asked the emperor to undress so that they could put his suit on. The emperor stood in the middle of the room with practically nothing on. The weavers made themselves busy pretending to dress him. The Lord Chamberlain came in to say that the procession was ready and everyone in the town was waiting to see him in his new clothes. The Emperor asked the Lord Chamberlain how he liked the suit. Uh, uh, magnificent, sir, he said, not wanting the Emperor to think that he had no brains. As the Emperor went out of the front door of his palace, the two tricky weavers left by the back with all the beautiful cloth they had stolen. The Emperor arrived in the town square. Look at his beautiful cloak, the people cried, wishing to show they had brains and could see it. Look at his wonderful suit, they all shouted. Not one of them was brave enough to say they couldn't see anything, except one little boy who shouted at the top of his... The Emperor has no clothes on! There was a hush. Then a whisper. And the whisper became louder and louder until it reached a roar. Look! He hasn't any clothes! Look! He's practically naked! Everyone roared. The Emperor was so ashamed, he ran back to the palace and stayed there for weeks and weeks, not daring to put his face outside. One day, he realised just how stupid he had been. He gave away all his beautiful clothes to the poor. And from that day, he ruled over his kingdom wisely, as all emperors should. And all because a little boy in the crowd told the truth. <laughs> Thank you.
Puss in Boots. There was once a miller who lived in a windmill. He had three sons and they were all very poor. When the miller died, he left to his eldest son the windmill, to his second son he left his donkey, and to his youngest son he left his cat. This young man was not very pleased at all. What can I do with a stupid cat, he said to himself. How can a cat help me to make my way in the world? One day, he set off with his cat to make his fortune. He walked for miles and miles and became so tired he had to rest. Sitting down on a large stone by the roadside, he heard a voice saying, Just give me a sack and a pair of boots and all your worries will be over. It was the cat who was talking. The young man thought, How silly, cats can't talk. And anyway, how on earth can a cat help me? But he gave him the boots and the sack. The next day, without his master knowing, the cat set off through the long grass, dressed in his bright new boots with his sack. And he came to a place where he knew there were hundreds of rabbits. He put some food in his sack and settled down to wait. After a little while, a rabbit came along and started to eat the food in the sack. In a flash, the rabbit was tied up and in the sack, and Puss set off for the king's palace which stood on a hill. He was shown into the throne room and he told the king that he had brought him a present of a fine young rabbit. It's from my master, the duke, the cat told the king. The king asked Puss all about the duke, who we all know was the miller's youngest son. But the king believed all the stories Puss was telling him. That night, Puss returned home but didn't tell his master what he'd been up to. Next morning, he returned to the place where he'd captured the rabbit. He put some food in the sack and waited for two partridges to come along. The same thing happened. The birds were caught and off to the king's palace he went. The king was even more pleased and said how wonderful his master the duke must be to send him all these presents. In the days that followed, Puss brought present after present to the king and told him that they were all from his master the duke. The cat became a great favourite and was even introduced to the king's daughter, who of course was a princess. One day, the king and the princess were riding in their carriage. This was the moment Puss had been waiting for. Running to his master, he told him to go for a swim. His master said he didn't feel like swimming right then. But you must, you must, quickly, cried his cat, pushing him towards the river. Into the river the young man went, and when he was in the middle of the water, Puss picked up his master's clothes and hid them in the bushes. Leaving his master in the river, Puss ran to stop the king's coach. The duke is drowning, shouted Puss at the top of his voice. Oh, we must save him, cried the king. Save the duke, save the duke. Within seconds, the king's guards were at the water's edge. The miller's son didn't know what was going on. He was freezing in the cold water and realising he had no clothes on, he was very embarrassed. His clothes have been stolen, Puss told the king. 
Returning to one of his guards, the king told him to ride back to the palace and bring the finest suit he could find. Remember, he didn't know what Puss had been saying. But a sly wink from Puss stopped him from giving the game away. The young man enjoyed the coach ride, particularly as it was with the most beautiful princess he had ever seen. She thought he was the most handsome duke she had ever seen. Meanwhile, Puss, who had no time for coach rides, was planning what he would do next. Running ahead of the coach, he came across some men working in a field. He told them that very soon the king would pass by, and if he asked them who owned the fields, they must say they belonged to the duke. Puss told them if they didn't do this, he would see that the king put them in prison for years and years. The coach came by. The king stopped the carriage and asked the men who owned the fields. The duke, sire, they said, because they didn't want to go to prison. The duke, eh? What a rich young man this duke must be, thought the king. Puss, meanwhile, had reached the castle of the wicked giant. It was the giant who actually owned all the land around, and he was a bad and cruel giant. Puss walked straight up to him and told the giant he had heard that he was one of the cleverest giants in the world. So clever that he could change himself into anything he wished. Yes, I can, yelled the giant. Watch me change myself into a lion. clever, said Puss, quite frightened by now. But any old giant can change himself into a lion. What about something small, like a mouse? Before you could wink your left eye, the giant had turned into a mouse. Too late, the giant realised what he'd done and what a mistake he had made. Puss pounced and in a flash had eaten him all up. When the coach arrived at the castle, Puss met it and said, Welcome to the castle of my master, the Duke. Puss winked at his master, which told him not to say anything. When they entered the castle, they couldn't believe their eyes. They thought it was the most magnificent castle they had ever seen. What a splendid young man this duke is, thought the king. Soon they all returned to the king's palace, where a magnificent banquet was given for the miller's son, who everyone now called the duke. The king stood up and announced that the duke and his daughter, the princess, were going to be married. The happy couple went to live in the giant's castle, which of course now belonged to the duke, and there they lived happily ever after. But what about Puss in Boots, who brought all this about? Well, he went to live with the Duke and Princess in their castle. He wore only the finest boots and had at least 100 pairs.
Mr. Bobbin was having problems moving into his new house. I don't think uh, Mr. Bobbin's very pleased with us, said Harry Dabble, the furniture man. I hope you don't think you've finished, said Mr. Bobbin. You won't be needing this tea just yet. I was looking forward to that cup of tea, Dad, said Gary. So was I, said Mr. Dabble. But we'd better try and sort all his furniture out. Now, let's see. You go and get the ladder. Why is it always me who gets the ladder and him who sits down? Gary grumbled to himself. Oh, da, 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 oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh, oh. What a performance, said Mr. Bobbin. Go all right, asked Mr. Dabble. Why do you always have to do everything the hard way? What do you mean, said Gary. The ladder's here. We'll pick it up then, said Harry, and stop playing about. shrieked Mr. Dabble. You careless noodle, you. What's the matter, Dad? You, you... Oh, said Mr. Dabble. We'll start with the television. Put the ladder there and up you go. It's... It's a long... It's a long way up, said Gary. said Gary. It's only Sponge. He lives here. He won't do you any harm. Does he know that? said Gary. Go and fetch that chair, said Harry. <laughs> said Gary. Get the chair, said Mr. Dabble. All right, said Gary. Come from, said Mr. Bobbin. Gully, stop playing with that bee, said Harry. Mr. Bobbin, said Gary. Sitting down on the job, eh? said Mr. Dabble. Come on, we've still got all the furniture to shift. Oh, said Mr. Bobbin. I think I'll go and take the kettle off the boil. Again. <laughs> he said. Mr. Bobbin was trying to tidy up his new garden. It was hot work.
Once he bought old Mr. Bobby and using old fashioned shears like those, said Harry. Yes, said Gary. You would think a man like that would have one of our super duper double deluxe motor mowers. But our knockdown giveaway price for one week only, said Harry. Particularly, said Gary, as it so happens we've got one in the van. Uh, well, said Mr. Bobbin, I'm a bit tempted. I suppose it can't do any harm just to look at it. This grass is terribly long. Could you show me it working on very long grass? Clumsy oaf. That hurt my big toe. No, I should have kept it out of the way, said Gary. Get the mower out, and this time be careful. Come on, come on, come on. Steady, steady. Ow! said Mr. Dabble again. Ow, ow! That's the other toe, he said. You did that on purpose, didn't you? You walking disaster, he said. Here's the grass box. Oh, oh, oh! 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 I hope you haven't hurt yourself, said Mr. Bobbin. No bones broken. Just a few bruises, I expect, said Mr. Dabble. Let me help you up, said Mr. Bobbin. Thank you, said Harry. Now, about the mower. I don't think much of your mower, said Mr. Bobbin. Look at all this bad earth. It's worse than the long grass. What are you going to do about it? Er, uh, well, said Gary sheepishly. Look, you can put it back again if you like. Just, just sort of pat it down. Good as new, he said. That's no use, said Mr. Bobbin. You've made a mess of my nice garden, and I want it put right. Hey, come back, Mr. Dabble. Oh. Oh, thank you, Sponge, said Mr. Bobbin. That's much better. It's still very long, though, he thought sadly. Oh, well, I'd better carry on with my old-fashioned clippers. Thank you very much, Sponge, said Mr. Bobbin. The Dabbles were confused. Light work of this, <laughs> said Gary. Hmm, said Harry. What have you got there? asked Mr. Bobby. It's a, a new street lamp for outside your house, said Mr. Dabble. Well, I don't like it, said Mr. Bobby. And anyway, I've already got that nice old lamp up there. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Bobby, said Harry. But here's all orders from the council. No, oh dear, said Mr. Bobbin. I suppose I'll have to put up with it. Right then, said Harry. <laughs> said Harry. Steady, steady, said Mr. Dabble. 
Oh. 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 Said Gary. Right. Put it down. Put it down. Said Harry. Oh. Not on my toe. He said. Sorry, Dad. Said Gary. Where does it go? In the hole. Said Harry through clenched teeth. You have put it up the wrong way round, said Mr. Dabble. Sponge, said Gary. said Harry. You're all right, said Gary. Oh, steady. Oh, said Gary. Come on, let go. Why shall I catch that cat, said Harry. Did you all check the lamp? asked Mr. Dabble. No, it was your end, said Gary. Your turn, said Mr. Dabble. Oh, said Harry. Seems all right, said Gary. Dad, said Gary. Come back. Oops, sorry, said Mr. Dabble. All right now, said Gary. Hmm, said Harry. I still don't like it, said Mr. Bobbin. It's a street lamp, said the policeman. It's in the wrong place. You were supposed to put that up in the next village. Oh dear. You're right, said Mr. Dabble. Got it. We're gonna look a right couple of ninnies putting this up, said Harry. Gary? asked Mr. Bobbin. Yes, thanks, Mr. Bobbin, said Gary. Why didn't you put the brake on? asked Harry Dabble. I did, Dad, said Gary. What's all this then? asked Mr. Bobbin. Well, you've just got it from Miss Armitage up at the hall, said Harry. We're going to do it up and sell it, said Gary. Well, that's a coincidence, said Mr. Bobbin. I was thinking about buying a car myself one of these fine days. What a pity this one needs so much doing to it. Oh, said Gary. What do you, Gary means, said Mr. Dabble, is that it may require one or two minor adjustments to bring it to peak performance. Well, why were you towing it then? asked Mr. Bobbin suspiciously. 
Oh, we uh, just aside petroleum, said Harry. Look at this, Mr. Bobbin, said Harry hurriedly. Now, don't see upholstery like this nowadays. Gary, let Mr. Bobbin have a proper look. It looks a bit worn to me, said Mr. Bobbin. It's just uh, well run in, said Harry, and it's very comfortable. Why don't you sit in it and uh, try it? Oh, well, that's one of those minor adjustments I mentioned, said Harry. Well, it is comfortable, said Mr. Bobbin. Very comfortable indeed, said Mr. Bobbin. Oh, the steering wheel's fully adjustable, as you can see, said Harry. Are you sure this car's safe? asked Mr. Bobbin. Of course it is, said Harry. Would you like a trial drive? Uh, well, uh, um, said Mr. Bobbin. Gary, said Mr. Dabble. Will you all give it a turn with the starting handle, please? Righty ho, Dad, said Gary. Anything you say? It'll, uh, it'll be the carburetor, said Harry. Wow, 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 said Gary. Wow, said Harry. I think it needs a slight push, said Harry. I knew I wouldn't sit down for long, said Gary. Um, Oh, oh, me head. Hey, ow! Me chin! Said Gary. Oh, I'm fed up with this silly old car. Get in, Gary, said Mr. Bobbin. I can't seem to get it into gear. Try reverse, said Harry. I don't think this car's quite my cup of tea, said Mr. Bobbin. Not even for 50p, said Gary. Only 50p, said Mr. Bobbin. Well, I, I, I could use the bits, I suppose. Thank you, said Harry. Hello, Sponge, said Mr. Bobbin. Look what I've just bought. That's not fair, said Harry. Don't be mean, Dad, said Gary. After all, Miss Armitage did pay us to tow it away. Pick up 
sticks. Seven, eight, lay them straight. Nine, ten, a good fat hen. Eleven, twelve, dig and delve. Thirteen, fourteen, maids are courting. Fifteen, sixteen, maids in the kitchen. Seventeen, eighteen, maids are waiting. Nineteen, twenty, my plate's empty. And they all lived together in a little crooked house. Cock a doodle doo, my dame has lost her shoe. My master's lost his fiddling stick and doesn't know what to do. Cock a doodle doo, what is my dame to do? Till master finds his fiddling stick. She'll dance without her shoe. Cock a doodle doo, my dame has found her shoe. And master's found his fiddling sticks in cock a doodle doo. Cock a doodle doo, my dame will dance with you. While master fiddles his fiddling stick for dame and doodle doo. I had a little nut tree, nothing would it bear But a silver nutmeg and a golden pear The king of Spain's daughter came to visit me And all for the sake of my little nut tree
shaven and shorn That married the man all tattered and torn That kissed the maiden all forlorn That milked the cow with the crumpled horn That tossed the dog That worried the cat That killed the rat That ate the malt That, that lay in the house that Jack built This is the house that Jack built This is the cock that crowed in the morn That waked the priest all shaven and shorn That married the man all tattered and torn That kissed the maiden all forlorn That milked the cow with the crumpled horn That tossed the dog That worried the cat That killed the rat That ate the malt That, that lived in the house that Jack built This is the house that Jack built This is the farmer sowing his corn That kept the cock that crowed in the morn That waked the priest all shaven and shorn That married the man all tattered and torn That kissed the maiden an awful long that milked the cow with the crumpled horn that tossed the dog that worried the cat that killed the rat that ate the malt that, that lay in the house the jack built this is the house the jack built a dog and a cat went out together to see some friends just out of town said the cat to the dog what do you think of the weather I think, ma'am, the rain will come down But don't be alarmed, for I've an umbrella That will shelter us both, said this amiable fella The man in the moon came tumbling down And asked his way to Norwich He went by the south and burnt his mouth By sopping cold peas porridge One misty, moisty morning when cloudy was the weather I chanced to meet an old man dressed all in leather He began to compliment and I began to grin And how'd you do? And how'd you do? And, and how'd, how'd you, you do, do again? One named Peter, one named Paul. Fly away, Peter, fly away, Paul. Come back, Peter, come back, Paul. Bobby Shafto's gone to see Silver buckles on his knee He'll come back and marry me Bonnie Bobby Shafto Bobby Shafto's bright and fair Combing down his yellow hair He's my forever male Bonnie Bobby Shafto Bobby Shafto's tall and slim He's always dressed so neat and trim The ladies they all peek at him Bonnie Bobby Shafto Bobby Shafto's getting a bear for to dandle in his arm. In his arms and on his knee, Bobby Shafto loves me.
I had a little hobby horse and it was dapple grey. Its head was made of pea straw, its tail was made of hay. I sold it to an old woman for a copper groat. And I'll not sing my song again without a brand new coat. All the rain. Then Incy Wincy Spider climbed the spout again. Old Mother Hubbard. Went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone But when she got there, the cupboard was bare And so the poor doggy had none She went to the baker's to buy him some bread But when she came back, the poor dog was dead She went to the joiner's to buy him a coffin But when she came back, the poor dog was laughing She took a clean dish to get him some tripe But when she came back, he was smoking his pipe she went to the fishmongers to buy him some fish But when she came back he was licking the dish She went to the alehouse to get him some beer But when she came back the dog sat in a chair She went to the tavern for white wine and red But when she came back the dog stood on his head She went to the hatters to buy him a hat But when she came back he was feeding the cat She went to the barbers to buy him a wig But when she came back he was dancing a jig She went to the fruiters to buy him some fruit But when she came back he was playing the flute She went to the tailors to buy him a coat But when she came back he was riding a goat She went to the cobblers to buy him some shoes But when she came back he was reading the news She went to the hosiers to buy him some hose But when she came back he was dressed in his clothes The dame made a curtsy, the dog made a bow The dame said your servant, the dog said bow wow Monday's child is fair of face Tuesday's child is full of grace Wednesday's child is full of woe Thursday's child has far to go Friday's child is loving and giving Saturday's child works hard for its living And, and the, the child, child that is born on the Sabbath day Is good and kind and sweet and gay Get it done by half past two Stitch it up and stitch it down And I will give you half a crown As I was going to St. Ives I met a man with seven wives Each wife had seven sacks Each sack had seven cats Each cat had seven kits Kits, cats, sacks and wives How many were going to St. Ives? Says he, it will not go for naught. 
Jack's goose and gander grew very fond. They both eat together or swim in one pond. Jack found one morning, as I have been told, his goose had laid him an egg of pure gold. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. If Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper, where's the peck of pickled pepper Peter Piper picked? In a shower of rain He stepped in a puddle right up to his middle And never went there again Hot cross buns, hot cross buns One a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns if you have no daughters, give them to your sons. One a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round. Go open and shut, open and shut, open and shut. The doors on the bus go open and shut all day long. The people on the bus step in and out, in and out, in and out. The people on the bus step in and out all day long. The driver on the bus says, Move along, please, move along, please, move along, please. The driver on the bus says, Move along, please, all day long. The windows on the bus slide up. The bus go swish, 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 swish. The wipers on the bus go swish, swish, swish all day long. The riders on the bus go bumpity bump, bumpity bump, bumpity bump. The riders on the bus go bumpity bump all day long. The babies on the bus cry wah 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 wah. The babies on the bus cry wah 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 all day long. The mothers on the bus. Go round and round, round. 
round and round, round and round The wheels on the bus go round and round all day long To see a fine lady upon a white horse With rings on her fingers and bells on her toes She shall have music wherever she goes Dance to your daddy, my little laddie Dance to your daddy, my little lamb shall have a fishy on a little dishy you shall have a fishy when the boat comes in dance to your daddy my little laddie dance to your daddy my little lamb Jack Spratt could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean, and so between them both you see they licked the platter clean. A frog he would a wooing go, sing hey ho says Roly. A frog he would a wooing go. Whether his mother would let him or no With a roly-poly gammon and spinach Hey-ho, says Anthony Roly So off he marched with his opera hat Hey-ho, says Roly So off he marched with his opera hat And on the way he met with a rat With a roly-poly gammon and spinach Hey-ho, says Anthony Roly And when he came to Mouse's Hall Hey-ho, says Roly and when he came to Mouse's Hall, they gave a loud knock and they gave a loud call. With a roly-poly gammon and spinach, hey-ho, says Anthony Roly. Pray, Mrs. Mouse, are you within? Hey-ho, says Roly. Pray, Mrs. Mouse, are you within? Yes, kind sir, I am sitting to spin. With, with a roly-poly gammon and spinach, hey-ho, says Anthony Roly. Pray, Mrs. Mouse, will you give us some beer? Hey-ho, says Roly. Pray, Mrs. Mouse, will you give us some beer? For Froggy and I are fond of good cheer. With a roly-poly gammon and spinach, hey-ho, says Anthony Roly. Now while they all were a merry-making, hey-ho, says Roly. Now while they all were a merry-making, the cat and her kittens came tumbling in. With a roly-poly gammon and spinach, hey-ho, says Anthony Roly. The cat, she seized the rat by the crown. Hey-ho, says Roly. The cat, she seized the rat by the crown. The kittens, they pulled the little mouse down. With a roly-poly gammon and spinach, hey-ho, says Anthony Roly. This put poor frog in a terrible fright. Hey-ho, says Roly. This put poor frog in a terrible fright. So he took up his hat and wished them good night. With a roly-poly gammon and spinach, hey-ho, says Anthony Roly. But as Froggy was crossing over a brook, hey ho, says Roly. But as Froggy was crossing over a brook, a lily white duck came and gobbled him up with a roly poly gammon and spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Roly. So there was an end to one, two, and three. Hey ho, says Roly. So there was an end to one, two, and three. The rat, the mouse, and, and the, the little froggy with a roly poly gammon and spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Roly. Up to 
the top of the hill And he marched them down again And when they were up, they were up And when they were down, they were down And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down There was a crooked man, and he went a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence upon a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat, which caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a little crooked house. The man in the moon came tumbling down and asked his way to Norwich. He went by the south and burnt his mouth by sopping cold peas porridge. Bobby Shafto's gone to see silver buckles on his knee. He'll come back and marry me. Bonnie Bobby Shafto, Bobby Shafto's bright and fair, combing down his yellow hair. He's my forever bear. Bonnie Bobby Shafto, Bobby Shafto's tall and slim, he's always dressed so neat and trim. The ladies, they all peek at him. Bonnie Bobby Shafto, Bobby Shafto's getting a bend for to dandle in his arm. In his arms and on his knee, Bobby Shafto loves me. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. Then Incy Wincy Spider climbed the spout again. Right up to his middle and never went there again.
Ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross To see a fine lady upon a white horse With rings on her fingers and bells on her toes She shall have music wherever she goes My goodness, said Mr. Bobbin. What's wrong with the church clock, Vicar? It's, it's old and worn out, replied the Vicar. We need a new one, really, but we haven't got enough money. Dear me, said Mr. Bobbin. Couldn't we have a collection in the village? It's been a long time since we had a jumble sale, said the policeman. That's a good idea, said Mr. Bobbin. I wonder if there's any jumble in my loft. I haven't had a chance to look up there since I moved in. Oh, may, may we look now? asked the vicar. I must say this is this is very encouraging. It's um it's very dark up here, said the vicar, and <coughs> dusty. There's a light switch down here, said Mr. Bobbin. Thanks, said the vicar. It looks as if there's quite a lot of stuff up here. Oh, said the vicar. It's it's stuck. Oh, 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 I, oh, ah, constable, said the vicar. Please help me get this off. It's not me, said the policeman. Aim over here. Oh, oh dear. Oh, what, what's these? Oh, I've, oh, oh, where are you now, said the vicar. Aim still over here, said the policeman. Oh, oh, oh. What's all the... Oh, oh, what's that? Shrieked Mr. Bobbin. It's the vicar, said the policeman. Well, what's happened to him? Asked Mr. Bobbin. He, uh, it's like mishap, said the policeman. Nothing that the force can't handle. You stand still, vicar. Oops, said the policeman. What happened? Said the vicar. My goodness, said the policeman. My ceiling said Mr. Bobbin. I'm stuck, said the policeman. Wait there, said Mr. Bobbin. I'll try and push you up from below. I can't reach, said Mr. Bobbin. Fitch something to push with, shouted the policeman. Right, uh, don't go away, said Mr. Bobbin, flustered. <laughs> <coughs> Don't bother, Constable, said the vicar. I've managed it myself. That's better. Perhaps we can get on now, then, said the policeman. Oh, look, here's an old gramophone. I, I wonder if it still works, said the vicar. Oh! 
Are you all right? shouted the policeman. Fortune favours the wicked. <laughs> said the vicar. Sponge, my lad, said the policeman. Why don't you do something useful for the change? lot of stuff, said the vicar. <coughs> What's all that? Really? It seems to be one of those construction kits, said the policeman. Sponge! What a marvellous clock, said the vicar. Well, we won't need to have a jumble sale after all, said Mr. Bobby. Bobby, said Gary. What's all that stuff? Seems to me, said Harry Dabble, that y'all need somewhere to store all that. It did. Uh, it just so happens. In the van. Oh, no, thought Mr. Bobbin. In the van, said Gary. We've got a super duper Dabble Deluxe Garden Shed construction kit. You're all right. Y'all won't regret your decision, said Harry. Now, Mr. Bobbin, if you just sign here, 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 and. Uh, and here. Where? Said Mr. Bobbin, flustered. Noodle! Shouted Mr. Dabble. This looks like the ideal site, Mr. Bobbin. Well, said Mr. Bobbin, I think. Oh, 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 oh. Mr. Dabble! Said Mr. Bobbin. Oh, oh. Said Mr. Dabble. I told you to be more careful. Go, go! Said Harry. Bring the next bit, Dad! Shouted Gary. Are you all right, Mr. Bobbin? Asked Gary. <coughs> said Mr. Bobbin. You've got hiccups. That's what you've got, said Harry. You need a sudden shock, said Gary. Boo! He said. <coughs> said Mr. Bobbin. It doesn't <coughs> seem <coughs> to have worked. <coughs> Boo again, said Gary. <coughs> said Mr. Bobbin. Oh. oh, oh, thank you, said Mr. Bobbin. That's cured it. Ow! Oh, said Harry. Excuse me, said Gary. Uh, boo! said Mr. Bobbin, helpfully. Ow! Oh, said Harry. That's for hiccups, not thumbs. Right a bit, said Harry. Left a bit, said Gary. Back a bit, said Mr. Bobbin. Hold it, please, said Mr. Dabble. Oh, oh. You'll have to get up and sit on it, said Harry. Whoa, said Gary. Can't you all use shorter nails? Oh! It's done now, said Harry. Not a bad job, eh, Mr. Bobbin? said Gary proudly. Dad, come out and have a look. Got he, said Harry Dabble. 
Yes, your dad, said Gary. The door's at the back, said Harry. Yes, dad, said Gary. It's right up tight against the garden wall and I can't get out, said Mr. Dabble. Why did you put it right up tight against the garden wall? Oh, dear, said Mr. Bobby. It really looked very nice, said Gary. Well, it doesn't look very nice now, said Mr. Bobbin. Sponge, is there anything you could do? Thank you, said Mr. Bobbin. That's wonderful, Spun. Why didn't y'all think of that? Said Harry. <coughs> said Gary. Boo! Said the others. a city of beautiful buildings and in it there lived a little boy whose name was Aladdin. Nearly every day he played in the marketplace. One day a very clever magician came to town. He was clever but sadly he was also a very bad man. He entertained Aladdin with his magic, and Aladdin thought what fun it was to have a magician as a friend. The magician gave Aladdin a piece of gold and told him to take it home to his mother. The people in the streets seemed to know something strange was happening. Aladdin arrived home told his mother about the magician and gave her the piece of gold. With it, they were able to buy all kinds of wonderful things. One day, the wicked magician arrived with lots of presents. Aladdin's mother thought how nice the magician was and agreed that he could take Aladdin on a long journey. A journey which would make them rich for the rest of their lives. Hurry, hurry, shouted the magician. It will soon be dark. Mile after mile they walked, and Aladdin became very tired. He looked back at the city and was a little sorry he'd agreed to go on such a long journey. He wished he were back with his mother. How much longer? asked Aladdin. How much farther do we have to walk? He started to become a little afraid. The trees seemed to be closing in. He imagined they had arms, legs and strange faces. Hurry! shouted the magician. Or there will be trouble for you. Suddenly, they came to a clearing. The magician began to speak magic words. There was a flash of lightning and flames sprang up from the ground. Through the flames came a great white smoke which surrounded the magician. When the smoke cleared, Aladdin saw a huge stone slab. Help me move it, said the magician. I am helping, Aladdin said as he pulled at the magician's cloak. You stupid boy, pull, pull, 
yelled the magician. Suddenly, the slab of stone came away, and below there was a long flight of stairs leading to a cave. Go down, said the magician, and help yourself to as many jewels as you can carry. But bring me an old lamp which you will find hanging on the wall. The magician gave Aladdin a magic ring to keep him safe. In the cave, Aladdin found jars and jars, all filled with jewels and precious stones. Come on, come on, the magician shouted down to Aladdin. Aladdin found the funny-looking lamp the magician wanted, and after filling his pockets, he climbed back up the stairs. He didn't understand why the magician wanted the lamp, so he told him that he'd forgotten to bring it. Then you stay where you are, shouted the magician, and he slammed the huge slab of stone down upon Aladdin. Aladdin didn't know what to do. How was he to get out? He remembered the ring, and he tried to get it off his finger. He rubbed it, and an enormous man appeared. He told Aladdin that he was the slave of the ring, and would do anything Aladdin asked. Oh, please, get me out of here, said Aladdin. The huge stone immediately flew into the air. Out came Aladdin. His mother was so glad to see him. She decided to polish the dirty old lamp Aladdin had brought from the cave. Suddenly, another huge man appeared. He told them he was the slave of the lamp and would do anything that they asked. So, as they were very hungry, they asked for something to eat. Because the lamp would do anything they asked, they became richer and richer and had everything they wanted. The years went by and Aladdin grew up to be a fine young man. He lived in a wonderful palace from which he often used to see the princess. He wondered if one day he would marry her. He often thought about the days when he was a little boy and found the lamp which made him rich and he wondered about the wicked magician and where he was now. Aladdin decided to visit the king's palace to ask if he could marry his daughter. The king thought he was a fine young man and agreed that he should become his son-in-law and marry the princess. One day, Aladdin was away with the army. The princess was in her garden. She heard a voice crying out, New lamps for old! New lamps for old! It was the wicked magician in disguise, so that no one would know him. The princess thought how glad Aladdin would be to have a new lamp for his old one. She didn't know what the old one could do, and that the slave of the lamp would do anything that Aladdin asked, so she changed it. The magician rubbed the lamp and the slave appeared. The magician commanded that Aladdin's palace and all that was in it should be taken far away to the desert. And see that I have a room there too, said the magician to the slave. The ground started to shake and the palace rose into the air with the princess inside it. The evil magician flew after it. Miles away and hours later, it came down in the middle of the desert. Very soon, the king became worried about his daughter, the princess. He sent his soldiers to find Aladdin immediately. The king told Aladdin all that had happened, and Aladdin set out immediately to find his princess. 
he searched the entire kingdom, but to no avail. Aladdin was almost ready to give up when he remembered the ring. Take me to my princess, Aladdin asked the slave of the ring. And before you could wink your eye, Aladdin was back at his palace. He took the magician by surprise, and after a long fight, he defeated him. <coughs> Looking around, Aladdin suddenly saw his princess with the magic lamp. The slave appeared, and they asked that everything be returned to the way it was before. The palace flew back, the wretched magician was no more, and Aladdin and his princess were together again. The king was absolutely delighted, and a huge party was given. Everyone in the town was invited. And what do you think happened next? Yes, they lived happily ever after. <laughs> time ago, in a town called Hamlin, which stood on the river Visa, a strange thing happened. This town of Hamlin was overrun by rats. There were thousands of them. There were so many that people just didn't know what to do, because the rats fought the dogs, killed the cats, Licked the babies in their cradles. Drank the soup out of great big ladles. Split open casks of salted sprats. Made their nests in men's Sunday hats. Even spoiled the women's chats. It was really terrible, and no one knew what to do about it. One day, a crowd went to the town hall to see the mayor and corporation, to ask them to do something about these awful pests. They said if he didn't do something quickly, they would throw him out. The mayor became very worried and upset, because he didn't know what to do either. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. In came the strangest man they had ever seen. His suit was half yellow and half red. He was tall and thin with blue eyes and a mouth that seemed always to be smiling. He told the mayor and corporation he could help them get rid of the rats. He told them how he could make anything that crawled or flew or walked follow him if he wished. He said his name was the Pied Piper. He had a yellow scarf around his neck, and at the end of it, he kept his pipe. He said he could get rid of the awful rats, but it would cost them 1,000 gold coins if he succeeded. The mayor said, If you can do this, I will give you not a 1,000, but 50,000, anything you wish. The piper stepped into the street, put the pipe to his lips and started to play. Suddenly, there was a sound of muttering. And then the muttering became a sound of grumbling. 
Out of the houses, the rats came tumbling. Great rats. Small rats. Lean rats. Brawny rats. Brown rats. Black rats. Grey rats. Tawny rats. Old ones. Young ones. Fathers. Mothers. Uncles. Cousins. Families running in their dozens. Brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, following the piper for all their lives. The piper went from street to street. The rats dancing after him. They came to the river, the River Visa, And into the river fell the rats, hundreds and hundreds of them. And they were all drowned. But not quite all. One swam across to the other side. It ran back to Ratland to tell what had happened, to tell how all the rats had drowned, except for him. Back in the town, the people were so happy the rats had gone that they rang the bells so hard that they almost knocked down the steeple. The mayor told the people to get long poles, clear out the nests and block up the holes so that never again would there be rats in the town. In the marketplace, the Pied Piper suddenly appeared and asked the mayor to pay him the 1,000 gold coins he had promised. No, said the mayor. Do you think I would be so stupid as to pay such a large sum of money to a man dressed in such silly clothes? You can't do anything about it anyway. All the rats have been drowned and can't come back. But I don't want to be unfair, so I will pay you 50 gold coins instead of the thousand. The Pied Piper became very angry as indeed he should, because a promise had been broken. He told the mayor he was dishonest and he would punish him for it. Do your worst, shouted the mayor. Into the streets again stepped the Pied Piper. He sounded three notes on his pipe. Suddenly, there was a rustling, a sound as if crowds were bustling. Small feet pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, little tongues chattering. Out of the houses, the children came running. Little boys and little girls with rosy cheeks and golden curls. Eyes were sparkling, teeth like pearls. Tripping and skipping ran merrily after the Pied Piper with shouts and laughter. The mayor and corporation could not believe their eyes. They could hardly move. All they could do was watch their children following the sounds of the pipe. They became very frightened as the piper turned towards the river. They remembered what had happened to the rats. But suddenly, the piper turned towards the mountain.
It's too high. He'll never get over the top, shouted the mayor. When they reached the mountainside, a huge doorway opened and in went the children. Then, with a tremendous bang, the doorway shut tight behind them. But not all of them. One little boy was lame and couldn't keep up. He returned sadly to the town, but there were no longer any other children to play with. When the grown-ups asked him why he had followed the piper, he said that the piper's tune had said that inside the mountain there was a wonderful place where children could play and sing and dance. A place that was magical and where children could have anything their hearts desired. They looked everywhere for the Pied Piper. They said they would pay him all the gold and silver in the town if he would only bring the children back. But it was too late. The children had gone forever. On the great church window in the city of Hamlin, they painted the story of how their children were stolen away and it stands there to this very day. cottage, a little boy called Jack lived with his mother. They didn't have very much money and sometimes not enough to eat. All they had was a cow called Flossie. Jack's mother said Flossie would have to be sold so they could buy food. Off Jack went to market. His mother cried as she waved him goodbye because she loved Flossie very much. On his way, Jack began to think of all the money he could get for his cow. Naturally, Flossie wasn't very happy about the whole business. As Jack walked through the countryside, he saw a strange old man coming towards him. The man said he was looking for a cow just like Flossie and he'd like to buy her. But, said the strange old man, don't sell her for money. I will give you these magic beans for her. So Jack took the beans and ran home to his mother. Flossie went along with the strange old man. Jack's mother was furious. Now, she said, we have no money and no cow either. Oh, how could you be so stupid and take beans instead of money? Jack said they were magic beans. Whoever heard of magic beans, said his mother. They are, they are, shouted Jack. This is all they're good for, shouted his mother as she threw them out of the window. Jack went to bed, very upset. Very upset indeed. Next morning, Jack got up and went to the window. He couldn't believe what he saw. 
an enormous beanstalk had grown from the beans that had been thrown out of the window. It was so big, it seemed to go right up into the clouds. Jack started to climb it to see how high it was. Up, up, up he went. It seemed to go on forever. When he reached the top, this is what he saw. An enormous castle. Jack knocked at the castle door. There was no answer, so in he went. There inside stood the tallest woman he had ever seen. She said she was the wife of the giant who lived in the castle and who liked to eat little boys for breakfast. You'd better look out, said the giant's wife. I can hear my husband coming. She put Jack in the huge oven so that he could hide. He peeped out to see what the giant looked like. Fee-fi-fo-fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, the giant roared. Has there been anyone here? No, said his wife. But the giant didn't believe her and became annoyed. He sat at a table and had two whole sheep for his supper. After he had eaten, he started to count his gold, and soon he was fast asleep. As he snored, the whole castle shook. Quietly, Jack climbed out of the oven. He climbed onto the table, took some of the gold, and ran away as fast as his legs could carry him. He threw the bag of gold down onto the ground, and down the beanstalk he went after it. At the bottom, his mother was waiting. She was glad to see him again, as she'd been worried about him. With the gold, they bought lots of things they needed, and were very happy. Jack couldn't wait to climb the beanstalk again. This time, it was different, as the giant was at home. Suddenly, Jack heard a tremendous roar. Fee-fi-fo-fum, shouted the giant. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Jack dived into the oven to hide. There's a small boy here, roared the giant. There isn't any such thing, answered his wife. Oh, why don't you play with the hen that lays the golden eggs? <laughs> All right, said the giant, and sat down to watch the golden eggs being laid. Jack watched everything from his hiding place. Egg after egg fell into the basket, and then, just as before, the giant fell asleep. Jack showed his mother the golden eggs and the hen that laid them, and he told her that now they'd be rich. They both remembered it had all happened because of Flossie the cow and the old man that Jack had met and the beans he had given to him, and they laughed and laughed and laughed. But Jack couldn't stay away from that beanstalk and had to climb it just once more. When he arrived, the giant was asleep. In front of him was his magic harp, which played without anyone touching it. Jack thought how much his mother would like it. They'd be able to listen to music whenever they wished. He grabbed it, and away he went with the harp under his arm. But he didn't know that the harp could talk as well as play music. He hadn't gone far when the harp started to shout for help.
out came the giant, yelling at the top of his voice. I'll have you for my dinner, he screamed. Down the beanstalk after Jack he came, nearer and nearer. Jack was terrified. He didn't want to be eaten up by the giant. At the bottom, Jack yelled to his mother. Bring an axe! Quick! Quick! He cried at the top of his voice. Then he started to chop at the beanstalk. The beanstalk began to topple, with the giant still holding on to it. Suddenly, down it crashed. The hole it made was so big, it could have reached to the other side of the world. Now who knows what the end of this story will be? Yes, you're absolutely right. Jack and his mother moved to a lovely new cottage and lived happily ever after. <laughs>